Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar today called a community discussion aligning sustainability portfolios and charitable giving. We have uh, a number of panelists here to, to, to discuss an important topic, a, a, a topic of great significance every day um, and, and or growing significance in, in, in our community these days, that of sustainability. My name is David Eminen. I'm a senior financial consultant for Manning and the Pure based in Pittsburgh. And in my role at the firm, I work with a number of different clients from individuals to families, to small business owners, um, to not-for-profits, endowments and foundations, and, and more. Um, we've gathered together some panelists from our experience at the firm that are, bring different viewpoints to the topic. I'd like to introduce them now, as starting with Tom. Tom works for the Allegheny Land Trust, which is a client of Manning and the Piers that I've worked with for more than 10 years. And I've become fascinated with their mission. Tom was so passionate about their mission that he left a very successful job in corporate America to join the Allegheny Land Trust as the Vice President of Development and, and uh, External Affairs. Uh, where he can tell the story of, of the Allegheny Land Trust to the world and to, to help them gather supporters and partners. We also have on the line David Colligan, managing partner of Colligan Law in Buffalo. David wears a number of hats as an attorney, but his passion for maple syrup making has led him to develop a practice in natural resource law, where he's uh, focuses primarily on timber and timberland. Last but not least, we have Kelly, Kelly Covley, who is a financial analyst at Manning and the Pier. She works in our quantitative strategies group, which is the group that's primarily responsible for our research into environmental, social, and governance factors, among other things. Um, and she'll talk about how those ESG factors can be used and are being used by the industry to uh, affect and, and assess the risk of companies in portfolios. Our agenda today is that we have about 40 minutes of prepared remarks um, for each of the or questions that I'll be asking each of the panelists and we'll be uh, having a dialogue here before we open it up for audience questions. If you have questions and I, we hope that you do, um, please use the button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A to type in your question. I'll be monitoring those questions throughout the, the next half an hour. And when we're done with our prepared questions, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Please realize that today's webinar is being recorded. And as a registrant, you will be re you'll receive an email within the next couple of days uh, with a link to that recording, and we'll also be posting a link to the recording on our website. So with that, I'd like to start by asking each of the panelists one general question that they each get to answer. I'm going to start with Tom to ask first, what does sustainability you mean to you and your organization, Tom? Yeah, uh, thanks, David. So we, we hear the word sustainability often these days in many different contexts. So when people, excuse me, when people talk about sustainability, they might be referring to the environment, oftentimes are referring to the environment, sometimes the economy, sometimes a business model, or maybe even an investment portfolio, or any number of other things that they deem to be sustainable or unsustainable. Uh, additionally, sustainability can be viewed through a very wide global lens, or a very narrow local lens, or even a personal lens. So sustainability, can mean a lot of different things to, to different people. At Allegheny Land Trust, when we consider sustainability as a conservation organization, of course, we're referring first and foremost to environmental sustainability and through the local lens, because our mission as a land conservation organization is to help local people conserve local land. So we work with communities in the Pittsburgh region to identify, strategically identify, um, green space that is worthy of or important to permanently protect for ecological, uh, scenic, and recreational importance and, and community benefit. But our, our view of sustainability goes far beyond those most obvious direct environmental benefits that 
you know, most people think of when they think of protected green space or land conservation. And that's really because true sustainability can't operate in a vacuum. It's really about the realization that many systems that we require to make our communities and in fact our world work for the long term or be sustainable are tightly interconnected. So our work to protect green space isn't just because it looks pretty or provides places for people to play or exercise or for animals to live, which although in my opinion, those three things are reasons enough, but the work is really more strategic and broad reaching because it, it you know, we believe in that strategically protected green space is at the center of the solutions to many of the big issues that our region is grappling with today. So things like clean air and clean water, flooding, landslides, combined sewer overflow, food insecurity, blight, overall community desirability, and just general things that impact the quality of life in a community or in a region. And they are all, are all tied together and green space is a part of the solution to all of those issues. And so how we treat our regions rapidly disappear in green space. And that's interesting because our region continues to consume green space um, at about 2000 acres a year, despite the fact that our population is flat and has been declining or flat for 25 years or more. So um, how we treat our regions rapidly disappear appear in green space today will largely determine whether we mitigate or exacerbate the most critical quality of life problems and those issues that, that I just mentioned that our region is working to, to solve. So because of this interconnectedness, and our belief that everything really is interconnected, the old adage that many of us are familiar with in different contexts, think globally and act locally, applies aptly to sustainability because what we do in our region impacts the sustainability of not only our communities, but our state, our country, and, and in fact, of course, the world. So for us at ALT, sustainability is, yeah, certainly about conserving local land for its obvious environmental benefits, maybe for the less obvious and more far-reaching benefits that I just mentioned that it has um, on our communities. And finally, in its broadest sense, for the contribution that addressing local sustainability through land conservation here in our little corner of the world makes to the global you know, desire or need for sustainability. So that's how we look at it here. Thanks, Tom. You can see his passion there. Dave, what about you? What does sustainability mean to you and your clients? Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, most of my natural resource clients own forest land. As forest land owners, they consider themselves stewards. They're stewards of the water, they're stewards of the land, they're stewards of the trees, and um, they feel like all of these things have been entrusted to them. So um, when you really break it down, natural resources are assets, and they can be financial assets, but they're other kind of assets too. And if you manage these assets uh, in a sustainable fashion, they can last indefinitely. So, um, you know, there's little uh, bromides used in the timber industry and in forestry law um, that say things like um, a decision made in the Northeast forest today has a 100 year impact. And that's so true. And it just points out how important sustainability is in uh, the natural world, in the forest land world that I practice law in. So, that's what sustainability means to me is to um, allow people to continue to use uh, um, environmental assets on a sustained basis. Thanks, David. Yeah, so that, that brings in a little bit more of a business sort of sense or outlook to it. For more of that, let's turn to Kelly and uh, you know, ask you, Kelly, what does sustainability mean to you and to Manning and Napier? So as investors, we're typically looking for companies that have a strong business model that we think can last over the long term. So we're always looking at uh, sustainability from a broad business perspective, and that often ends up being intertwined with environmental sustainability. And in the investing world, environmental sustainability, environmental sustainability falls under this larger umbrella of ESG, the acronym uh, we mentioned earlier, it stands for environmental, social, and governance. 
And these three fact uh, factors are all intended to capture a company's sustainability and its broader societal impact. The E for environmental, obviously this is where the environmental sustainability issues fall. It's looking at conservation of the natural world. Uh, the social bucket is looking at how a company relates to people, be it locally or globally, uh, within the organization or outside of the organization. So this might look at workforce diversity, working conditions. Um, and then the G, governance, is looking at how the company is run. So this includes things like the composition of the board of directors or how executive compensation is determined. And going back to what Tom said, all three of these factors are really, they're interconnected. They're, they're gonna influence each other. So a company's impact on the environment will have an impact on the people in the local communities it operates in and the broader global community. Um, governance is going to influence how the E and the S factors are carried out. Another important thing uniting the three of these factors is they're typically not really captured in your traditional financial statements. But there has been more and more focus and interest in ESG from investors, uh, from regulators and lawmakers, and from the companies themselves. And as investors, one of the reasons ESG factors are important is that they can represent material risks for a company's operations. So these can have a real impact on a company's profitability and in turn on the performance of its uh, stock. So for example, if a company causes some environmental or social damage, they could face litigation that they have to pay for. Uh, even if they're not breaking any rules today, there could be regulation down the road that they have to pay to come up into compliance with. Uh, as there's been more interest in ESG, there's been more and more information available to us as investors there's been a really big increase in the share of companies that are publishing some sort of sustainability report. And obviously this information helps us understand and assess the ESG factors we're concerned with. It's also a big positive because these disclosures create accountability for companies. Uh, if you start publishing a metric, you really don't want that metric getting worse. Uh, a lot of the time it's also not really acceptable for it to stagnate either. So putting out these disclosures uh, give companies an incentive to continue to improve their ESG behavior. There are many different ways you can incorporate ESG into your portfolio, but overall it's quite clear that uh, ESG is increasingly important to really all parties involved and that's a trend that we expect will continue. Oh, thank you, Kelly. Great. Um, so I'd like to dive in and, and ask each, each, each panelist a little bit more detail about their topic. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to, we'd like to start off with a polling question of the audience. So take a look at this question. What is your level of understanding of a land trust, at least before today's discussion? And pick the, pick the response that describes you the best. While we wait for some of some, uh, uh, the results to come in, um, it does seem like we are getting some consensus from each of the panelists on, on, on the, the interconnectivity of a lot of issues that can be uh, summarized by sustainability and the long-term nature of this question. So let's take a look at the results. Okay, so um, that's interesting. Tom, you can maybe, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're getting a great opportunity to in, introduce people to a little bit more about the concept of a land trust here. Some, most people have heard about it, but don't know a whole lot about it. So with that, let's, Tom, let's, let's ask you, you, in your first answer, you focused mostly on sort of the community and, and, and sort of global benefits of, of uh, conservation. What are, what's the, what are the, the benefits to the individual, particularly the landowner who's maybe thinking about conserving their land or donating to a land trust? Yeah, uh, first, let me address the poll real quickly. It's interesting where that those numbers came in. So we will we'll, uh, we'll talk about what a land trust can do and how we can help. 
uh, for people that want to do that. But by and large, Land Trust is a nonprofit conservation organization that exists to conserve land and, uh, and to help local communities or people conserve land uh, for the long term. But yeah, I think your question was um, why or, you know, you know, what are the benefits or why do people support land conservation? So well, people support, you know, our efforts at Allegheny Land Trust for a whole lot of reasons, ranging from a deep concern, a personal concern for the environment, and they recognize that protecting land helps the environment. Maybe it's to protect uh, or help to protect a local green space right in their community. The spirit could be that specific. Or maybe it's um, to ensure conservation of land permanent conservation of land that's special to them or their family or some combination of those reasons. In some cases, it's a short-term local uh, reason to, to um, you know, protect one piece of ground and they're kind of in and out, but uh, in, uh, you know, it can also be a more uh, broader or you know, through that global lens and be a, a more global reason. But in almost all cases, donations to conserve land um, or donations of land are driven by a personal feeling or an understanding of the donor that conservation of land has a lasting impact. And donating to support that lasting impact provides a strong level of personal satisfaction to the donor. Hopefully if we have time, I'll get to tell a story or two later about, uh, about this kind of personal satisfaction but that, that donors give. But we see it over and over again from people who, who support our work, that there's a personal understanding of the benefits of protecting land to their community and and maybe you know, in a broader sense, to you know, on up the line globally, um, and they care about that, and they want to leave a legacy. Is oftentimes the case. So, uh, of course, in addition to that personal satisfaction, donations to conserve land um, can also provide some really substantial tax advantages to the donor, as any cash donation can. But there are other and more, um, uh, you know, larger or more substantial donations that. Um, are based on the size and the type of the gift, and of course the donation of the donor's financial situation. And we can talk more about those later if there's an interest. Great, great, thank you. So, um, David, uh, you know, in your natural resource work with clients, um, you know, have have you seen any of them work with land trusts, and and what are the issues that you might have seen, um, you know, when when you're thinking about putting an easement or a conservation easement on your property? Okay, it's a great question, Dave. Um, I've actually had the um, pleasure of working with, um, I represent one land trust. I represent um, several clients in the Adirondack uh, area of this state uh, that are some of the largest landowners. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of acres of land that are under conservation easements. And I've also represented um, private, what you would call small forest landowners who are looking to donate uh, a conservation easement to a land trust. So I've had the chance to look at it from several different points of view and from several different um, um, problematic areas. And I, I think the issues uh, kind of fall into the categories. Um, the first category, I would call it limits and rules. Uh, once you create a conservation easement, by definition, you're creating limits and rules. So you have to follow the limits and follow the rules to comply with it. And there'll be um, somebody like Tom who'll be coming around to look, make sure you're following the rules um, or Tom will send somebody. Um, uh, the second issue is cost. Um, there's a cost to maintaining a conservation easement properly. Um, sometimes uh, the cost comes from a municipality. Uh, the um, conservation easements in New York, I refer to in the Adirondack region, were purchased by the state of New York. Uh, the DEC enforces them. Okay, I just read it in a paper um, today that I believe it's called Long Gardens in Boulder, Colorado. It was bought by the city of Boulder, uh, a conservation easement on the gardens so they can continue to grow flowers and not have a turnover to development. Uh, it's a flower garden uh, grow out uh, site. Um, uh, so that's um, something that needs to be dealt with. I think uh, hopefully Tom can touch on that later, but uh, we, we find that sometimes the landowner has to make a donation of money. Sometimes the money's coming from the municipality. And sometimes the land trust, because it's unique or highly sensitive property, 
will fund the whole thing themselves or raise a, um, a collection to fund it. So there's all kinds of different aspects on how to cover the cost. I think the other uh, category that I'd like to touch on just briefly is access. I think there's a big misconception out there that if you create a conservation easement on your property, you are going to give permission to the world at large to come onto your property and anything uh, could be further from the truth. Um, it's one of the rules and regulations of your conservation easement is how much public access there'll be. And you can actually limit it to the um, owners that existed before the conservation easement, if you wish, uh, and the people who are um, checking on the rules and regulations you've agreed to. Uh, it's a very small group of people that get access to the property as a result of a conservation easement. So um, I think that um, uh, the um, um, categories that I've outlined cover most of the issues that I uh, get asked to deal with as a lawyer in the conservation easement area. Okay, great. Tom, do you want to um, respond to any of those issues? Well, yeah, I, well, I think just, I'd like to just add that, you know, we've, we've talked about easements, but land trusts really can conserve land in two main ways, and, and donors can support land conservation in two, two main ways. Not everybody has, you know, large tracts of property or even small tracts of property that they would like to place a conservation easement on, but so just to kind of clarify, land, we can serve land in two main ways, by owning it, fee simple, or by holding a conservation easement, which is, as David was talking about, is severing the development rights from that land. So that somebody can continue to live on their property, but know that it will be permanently protected in the long term. You can also pass it on to their heirs or even sell it, but knowing that the, the um, most of the land will be, will be protected. So, at Elegant Land Trust, we acquire land and easements through acquisition at market price, through acquisition at bargain sale, or you know, less than market price, which becomes a partial donation, or, or through donation from the landowner in, in its entirety. But the important thing to know is um, every conservation transaction is different based on the owner's desires of, for the land, the amount of value or land involved and the level of community involvement and the level of funding necessary. But a capable land trust will have the ability to um, manage the project's component from start to begin, start to finish, including raising the necessary dollars or guiding the uh, property owner or the donor through, you know, through their desires. Great. Uh, yeah, that is a, the, um, you know, having that money available to steward properties after donation and after they've been taken over by the land trust is an important part. And sort of it's the role that Manning and DePere is helping Allegheny Land Trust with in our work with you. Um, the Allegheny Land Trust has a stewardship uh, fund, essentially working as an endowment that uh, the proceeds of which are, you know, um, the spending policy from that portfolio helps to pay for stewardship of properties under Allegheny Land Trust's uh, control. There's also a, um, an inter internship portfolio, the uh, proceeds of which um, helps support the, part, the partial cost of hiring an intern every year to work on a particularly complex property that the Allegheny Land Trust has. So um, that's a, those are good things to keep in mind. Um, so far, we've been mainly talking about donating land and or easements, but not everyone has property that's that's appropriate or available for such donations. What are some other ways that people can support a land trust? Tom? Yeah, um, like I was touching on a little bit before, an easement is one way, as you just said, and, and, and in other cases, we, you know, we acquire property. Um, but if somebody doesn't have land or you know, to place an easement on or to donate the land, uh, our work is funded by private donors. So people who passionately share you know, the understanding of the importance of land conservation that we've been talking about and choose to get involved by um, making a financial donation. So in some cases, this is as simple as a donation of cash or appreciated stock or proceeds of an IRA. And like any donation to any other you know, uh, 501c3 nonprofit, uh, those donations can be deducted as such for tax purposes, depending upon the financial status of the donor. Additionally, um, some conservation-minded individuals um, decide to create their legacy by including land trusts in their estate planning. So um, 
all of those ways are ways that you can support a land trust in your area and help the conservation mission and help build sustainability by supporting projects that, that uh, the land trust, you know, land trust is undertaking. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. Um, let's get back to Kelly to, to, to learn a little bit more about the way that the ways that people are using ESG factors to sort of uh, influence their investments. But before we do that, let's, I'd like to go to another polling question. And you can see here, um, ask yourself this question, thinking of your own personal investment portfolio, what is your level of interest in ESG or other socially responsible investing techniques? And while we while we get those responses, um, we'll we'll uh, allow Kelly to think about a little bit more about how uh, it, to discuss different ways that ESG can be used and where you get the ESG information from. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think when a lot of people think ESG in investing, their mind immediately goes to what we know as impact investing. And with impact investing, you are only investing in companies whose core business is actively solving some social or environmental issue. It could be a company providing healthcare for at-risk populations or um, a foundation focused on environmental preservation. And with impact investing, returns can at times be something of a secondary goal uh, impact investing also tends to take place primarily in private markets, whereas we are focused on publicly listed securities. And there are still plenty of ways you can incorporate ESG into a portfolio of public securities. One is what we know as an exclusionary approach, also called negative screening. So here you're completely excluding certain industries or business exposures from your portfolio. Our clients are able to do this and we do it at a client's level because preferences and priorities can vary from person to person, from client to client. Uh, for example, a lot of universities are interested in divesting from fossil fuels, but a foundation who focuses on lung cancer research is probably gonna be mostly concerned with eliminating tobacco exposure from their portfolio. And an important thing to be aware of with the exclusionary approach is how much you're actually excluding uh, via your exclusions. So if you have um, a portfolio that's only ever gonna invest in US securities, um, excluding coal exposure from your portfolio probably won't have a large impact on your portfolio holdings. In other cases, you might be excluding more from the investable universe. And this will just increase the risk that the performance of your portfolio looks uh, meaningfully different from that of the unrestricted portfolio. And then the final method I'm going to talk about is what we know as ESG integration. And with ESG integration, you're not wholesale excluding anything in particular from your portfolio, but the investment analysts will be looking at factors that are material to uh, the company's performance. So these are those examples I talked about earlier where um, ESG issues can have a meaningful impact on a company's profitability and in turn how it uh, performs as an investment. And with ESG integration, um, ESG factors are really, they're an additional risk that the investment analyst will consider in determining the fair value of a company they're looking at. Um, so these are the three most prevalent approaches. There, there are others, and there's not really one best approach. It's going to depend on the type of product, what it invests in, and of course, a client preference. And in terms of where we get that information, um, we have a third-party provider. I actually see it in one of the questions here, um, MSCI or Sustainalytics. For those unfamiliar, those are two um, uh, providers who give ESG information and scoring um, available to us as investors. And um, what we went with MSCI for a few reasons. Uh, 
they had the best breadth of coverage. You know, they're uh, giving scores to a good number of companies. Um, their research was very in-depth. And they also had information available beyond just the high level scores. And this is really useful, especially for an ESG integration approach where there is some investment analyst judgment that needs to go into it. Um, so our investment analysts will be uh, looking at each of the factors, why the company performs well or poorly on different metrics and applying that um, to their company valuation as needed. Great, thanks Kelly. So it does sound like there's, there are a lot of choices. There are a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, it looks like from the results of our poll that 41% of the audience is already used, having ESG influence their portfolio. So that's great. It's interesting to, to learn that. For those, uh, th those that have not yet started looking at it, um, I would encourage you to reach out to your financial consultant uh, your advisor, whether it be at Manning and Appear or, other, uh, or elsewhere, and ask more questions based on some of the information maybe you learned today. Um, and certainly, if you're interested in learning more about how Manning and Appear uh, might be able to help you with that, we'd be happy to take, uh, you know, to, to contact you or, or to take questions from you directly. Um, speaking of, you know, you know, having that dialogue with your advisor, David, you know, how do you go about bringing up the idea of conservation easements or land grants with your clients? Well, I think it's usually in the context of estate planning. And um, I have to start all estate planning discussions out with clients by asking them, what are your personal goals? And after they explain to me their personal goals, if um, they don't mention charity, I feel it's the duty of the estate planning attorney to ask specifically every client, what are your charitable intentions? And I find uh, a lot of people don't volunteer uh, a charitable intent, but when you ask them directly, uh, probably 75% of them say they have a charitable intent, but they don't know how to proceed. If they happen to be a natural resource client, um, I can point out to them that they could consider a conservation easement um, donation to a land trust if they're interested in doing that and um, many of them take me up on that um, if they don't have any land and not everybody owns land as you know um, a lot of them say um, i su would support a charitable cause but i need some ideas and i always mention land trusts as one of the ideas they can consider because i think people who hike cross-country ski, hunt, fish, um, walk their dog, uh, a, a whole bunch of other activities uh, really want to support the natural world and the people who are maintaining that natural world for their benefit. And they would love to pay them back with a charitable gift, but they never realized that they could give to a land trust to pay them back for all the use that they're getting out of the natural trails in um areas that are accessible to them until you bring it up to them. So there's many opportunities to uh, support um, conservation easements and land trusts in estate planning. And I've uh, found that people are receptive to that. And, and great. Um, Tom, speaking of that, where, do you, where would somebody find a land trust if they're not in, in the Pittsburgh area to support? Yeah, that's a good question. So there, there's a, an umbrella network called the Land Trust Alliance. It's a national you know, uh, network of land trusts. You can find information at, on them and then find a land trust near you if you went to their website, which is www.landtrustalliance.org. And of course, if you're in the uh, Western Pennsylvania area, please feel free to contact me anytime with questions. Send me an email. Uh, we can give me a call at 412-741-2750 if you wish, or just look us up at Allegheny Land Trust and I'd be happy to, to talk to you more about what we do and what Land Trust do. But if you go to that LTA website and uh, put in your zip code, it'll, it'll provide you with Land Trusts near you. Great, yeah. Um, and while we're, while we're talking to Tom, you mentioned earlier maybe some inspiring stories or specific examples of some clients that have donated. Yeah, and I guess I guess maybe a lot of um, 
uh, you know, nonprofit organizations uh, see this kind of passion or um, inspiring things from their largest supporters, but we see it from small supporters all the way up to large supporters. I, I talked earlier on about the reasons people, you know, give to conserve land. Um, and, and almost every project we do, we're, we come away really, you know, inspired by the kind of things that people do. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, easements. So we have a number of people who have placed easements uh, either by donation or a bargain sale on their property. And I could talk to you about them, but th there are people who uh, you know, lived on their land their whole life, or maybe even their second or third generation on the land, and they just want to see that preserved. And so they, they get into easement discussions with us. Um, but the story I'm going to share, if, if I could, that I might share now is not about an easement, but about a donation. So we, we just completed, or are about to complete, um, a very large, for us, acquisition of, a, of um, a former country club close into the city, uh, but a beautiful piece of land that the community wanted to see um, not become um, you know, consumed by some type of development, but to be preserved as a, as a public green space for you know, environmental and community benefits. And for us, that was a pretty big haul. We needed to raise $3 million for that project. And I am happy to say that we were successful in doing so, but I want to tell about something that happened near the end of that, the end of that uh, process. We had somebody call me and say that he has been, um, he made a small donation early on. He and I stayed in touch. He was curious about the project. Um, and near the end, when we still needed, oh, just under a million dollars um, to go, we had some irons in the fire, but he came through, he and his wife decided to to take an investment that they had been holding for a long time since the passing of their adult son and donate it to the project. And it was $125,000. Um, they thought that the timing was right to kickstart or to maybe kind of bring us across to our finish line. But the reason they did it is because their son um, was very passionate about the environment and his career was in uh, an environment and they wanted to leave, they wanted to honor his life and leave, leave a legacy for him by making that significant donation. And then they did that. And then two other people stepped forward with very similar donations and it got us with the same personal reasons that they wanted to do that. And it took the project uh, over the top. But when, when people are willing to make that kind of commitment for land conservation and for our work, it, it's really inspiring. So. Yeah, great. That's so good to hear. That's, that is inspiring. Um, you know, of course, as, as a financial advisor, um, you know, I'm always working with our clients to determine, to try to project what, what their finances are going to look like through their entire lives. And hopefully most people are able to leave a, a, a margin of safety so that their, 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 out, their assets will likely outlive them. And uh, most of them will probably leave the majority of that to their children and their heirs, but um, they may have a legacy. They may have a, a fairly large part of their portfolio that they may want to um, leave to charity or to, to specific cause. And so we've given everybody some great ideas today. Um, but it's also important as a financial advisor to make sure that, that they get as good a return as possible in order to make sure that that legacy is there. Um, so I, I think turning it back to Kelly, it sounds like from what you're saying that some of these ESG factors or taking them into account doesn't necessarily mean reducing your returns. Is that accurate? Yes, there's a growing body of research that shows that ESG, uh, or I'm sorry, funds that integrate ESG don't necessarily underperform your traditional funds that aren't incorporating that. And that really makes sense uh, because of this uh, once you understand ESG issues as an additional risk that needs to be considered for the business. For example, if the market's not correctly pricing in litigation risk for some companies, ESG aware investors will have an edge in valuing those companies. And the relative performance will probably depend exactly how ESG is being incorporated into a fund. But if ESG issues are essentially another tool in the valuation toolkit, we would not expect that to drag down performance. Great. So we're getting some really great questions that are coming in and we'll get to those in a minute. But before we move to that, it does seem like we've 
we've really found a, a, a concluded that sustainability is a key issue that affects a lot of different uh, ways of approaching everything, uh, the way your community runs, the way your you, the, the community and, and, and people are able to live, um, as well as the way business and the economy runs. So um, th th this was a really interesting discussion. Um, we hope to, to, to be able to uh, expand on it in the future with you. But to, to turn to the audience questions, I think there's a, there's a real quick one here um, for Tom. Um, if I have land, how do I benefit to put it into a land trust? Yeah, well, the, the first benefit is the personal one that I talked about before. So if you have land and you want to see it conserved for any of the reasons that we've already talked about, um, then you benefit by knowing that a worthy organization will, will protect it and conserve it in perpetuity. If you're looking for financial reasons to benefit, um, if you donate that land or donate an easement on that land, some of the things that we've been talking about, <clears throat> then uh, the value of your donation for say, for example, an easement can be deducted from your, from your federal income for, for tax purposes, for federal income tax purposes, over a period of 14 years. So there's a substantial tax benefit. Now, that's as far as I'll go because I'm not a tax consultant. You should talk to a professional about that, but there is a substantial um, tax benefit for people who donate land and donate easements to incentivize conservation. Great. Uh, Kelly, there were a couple of questions um, uh, talking maybe a little bit about uh, engagement as a strategy with companies and voting proxies with specific client goals. Do you want to address that? Sure. In terms of engagement as a strategy, um, our analysts may meet with company management at times, but it's typically more in the interest of information gathering versus actively guiding um, management towards a certain uh, particular behavior. In terms of voting proxies, uh, you know, shareholders are entitled to vote on certain issues that are brought up. Um, we uh, have a proxy policy in place um, where typically we will be voting in favor of increased disclosures for companies. Um, above all, our proxy policy, though, is designed to seek to uh, ensure uh, long-term benefits to the shareholders and our clients themselves. Uh, along similar lines, um, you know, there was a question asking whether you think, we think that large institutional investors like universities and large endowment plans are driving the growing popularity and expansion of ESG investing products? That's a great question. I think uh, large institutional investors it's, it's certainly easy for them to have a big impact. Their voice goes a long way, even if you're just you know, one institutional investor, if you want a certain thing, you're going to attract a lot of, intention, uh, of attention. I think individual investors though have had a pretty large impact on um, attracting attention to these issues. I believe especially younger generations of investors who are starting to build up that nest egg are particularly interested in this. And that of course makes it necessary for everyone to uh, adapt to that. I also would note that I think um, internationally in particular European countries tend to be a little bit ahead of the curve on this, if you will. There, it's a lot more um, standard for really any large institutional investor to be pretty, quite, quite focused on ESG issues. Great. Um, so David, there's a question here. Um, can I sell my land in the future if I've created a conservation easement in perpetuity with a trust? Yes, the answer to that is um, your land is still very sellable. The person who buys it will buy it um, subject to the conservation easement if there's a conservation easement on it, and they will have to abide by the rules and limits that we talked about earlier. But the main thing is um, you have already either donated the value of the development rights or sold them in order to create the conservation easement. 
So you can't sell them twice. Uh, you will get a lower price for your land with a conservation easement on it, equal to the amount that you took as a deduction uh, or more um, on your uh, original gift. So if, for instance, um, you're in a suburban area and you wanted to preserve the natural um, um, environment of a, a large parcel of land that could otherwise be developed. Um, when you uh, created the conservation easement, uh, you might have gotten a donation um, credit on your tax return in the hundreds of thousands of dollar amount. Well, when you sell your land, you're not going to be able to sell it to developers. So people who would buy it generally will pay less for it, okay? And it's because it can't be split up, it can't be developed. Uh, so it has a lower value, but in some ways you've already harvested that value by taking a deduction or getting paid for it by the state <laughs> or municipality. So there's, um, it's, it's a totally fair system uh, in terms of you getting a return on your uh, asset that you're selling. Great. Hey, um, Tom, there's a question here that might be it's right up your alley. Do states have financial programs to help land trusts acquire and landowners give land for conservation purposes? Uh, yeah, so great question. Every state's a little bit different. So the first thing I would say is that some states have additional tax incentives for land donations or easement donations. Um, the second thing I would say is that many states also support activities of land trust and others to acquire property for conservation um, purposes. Pennsylvania, for example, does have um, a, a pretty substantial grant program handled by our Department of Conservation and Natural uh, Resources, CCNR, that we are eligible to apply for and receive matching funds for our projects. So it, uh, the maximum that our program in Pennsylvania ever covers for something like that is 50%. We have, to, we have to raise the other 50 if we're fortunate enough to be approved for that grant. So, but, but, but most states do have, many states do have um, grant opportunities that help land trusts acquire the property. So that doesn't, you know, that, the, way, the way that would work is we express an interest in a property, we're in the negotiation with the seller to either acquire the property or acquire the easement. And then we, of course, as the buyer have to come up with the money, we would be the ones that approach the state to, re you know, to receive state grants as part of our funding picture to make that acquisition. And, and everyone is, every acquisition is a little different. Sometimes we are fortunate enough to get, to get state donations, uh, I'm sorry, state grant support. Sometimes it's all on, you know, on private donations, usually it's a mix. Yeah, and that's a lot of what you do as a land trust is try to figure out what's the best way to, to reach the goal, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's where we would, that's where we would come in. So it would be unlike, I mean, there may be other states that have programs, but in Pennsylvania, it would be um, unlikely that a landowner would approach a, the state for uh, a concert, you know, for this type of project. It would typically be somebody like us who, you know, handles the entire work of piecing all that together and raising the appropriate funds and knowing whether we can get some from the state or none from the state or depending upon the, on the project. Yeah. 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 So uh, Kelly, there's a question here that uh, I think gets at the topic of you know, specific controversies or, you know, the, the, um, it's, the, the question says specifically that he, someone has read that 5G technology may be harmful to the environment. Is this an issue or other potentially, you know, is that, is that an issue that Manning and Fear is going to be looking at or other uh, ESG investors are looking at to try to get in front of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and certainly not my area of expertise, this particular issue. We have analysts who, I'm, I don't know what analysts in particular, but we have analysts who are focused on certain coverage areas. So we will have someone who specializes in that area there to assess a potential impact on the environment and the societal impact and the risk that that introduces for the potential investment. So I would say I, I do think our analysts covering companies that um, uh, involve that technology will have an excellent understanding of potential implications and uh, risks that introduces to the companies. Okay. And, and Tom, there's a good question here. We're kind of getting to the end of the, some of the questions. So, but um, 
you know, what's what's the interaction between a land land conservancy, land trust, and 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 the government? To, uh, you know, sometimes your property you you may find it at, at that advantageous to turn the property over to the public as a park. Is that correct? Well, sometimes yeah. Sometimes we'll work with um, so there's a couple issues around around that, but sometimes we'll work with the county government or the state government if we acquired or obtained that property. Um, with the ability to, to do that, we'll sometimes work with the state to enlarge a, you know, a state forest or other land trust do that, or the county to enlarge a county park. We always do that by placing um, a covenant or an easement on the property before we do that, because that way we can be sure that regardless of who is in, uh, you know, on the council 20 years from now or 50 years from now that, that they can't turn around and you know, sell that property because, you know, by an act of legislation or whatever. So we will work with um, county government, but we'll, we'll place a, you know, a legal easement or a legal covenant on the land before we, you know, sell or donate to the county. Some land trusts do a lot of that, depends on where you are. We don't do a whole lot of, of uh, that kind of work, but it, but it can be done. Okay, great. Well, that wraps up our questions for today. Um, we again, we really appreciate everybody's time. We hope this was uh, interesting and and added to your knowledge and 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 maybe even piqued some questions that that all of us could help you with. If you're interested in learning more about any of the topics, please reach out to us and we'll try to put you in touch with the right person or the right resource to get some answers. But thank you again for your 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 time. Have a great day and uh, take care. <laughs>